I want us to think for a few minutes about this call to gospel sincerity. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 with me, verses 14 to 17. Second Corinthians 2, 14 to 17. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would as I read from God's word. If you know anything about Second Corinthians, you know that the Apostle Paul spends the bigger part of it defending his ministry. He'd been falsely accused by a group we would know as the Judaizers. We've talked about them before. He will mockingly call them super apostles in the course of his defense. But in this portion, he's rejoicing in the victory that is ours in Christ no matter what others may say. Follow along as I read this. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May today, may we be gripped with this Word that has fallen on hard times because of abuse of the Word. May we be gripped with it and commit ourselves anew and afresh to gospel sincerity. Thank you. Please be seated. You've all heard it, perhaps even in times when maybe you were just religious and weren't really a Christian, you may have even said it, that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, we would tend to dismiss that, but I really think the biblical answer is, well, it depends on what the meaning of sincere is, how you're defining sincere. There's a definition for it in the, in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. It's free of dissimulation, honest, free of adulteration, pure, marked by genuineness, true, wholehearted, heartfelt, hearty, unfeigned, genuine in feeling, stressing the absence of hypocrisy. Earnest devotion is another way to describe it, without reservation or misgiving. A depth of genuine feeling outwardly expressed. Honest, warm, exuberant in displaying feeling. Sincere. There are a couple of words in the Greek New Testament that are translated as sincere. I want you to look at a passage, just a brief verse here, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Earlier in this same letter, what we, we call it Second Corinthians, Paul, Paul references another letter along the way, so we, don't, we simply have in our Bibles first and Second Corinthians. Where he says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12, For our boast is this, that the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. And then the text that we read, a portion of that, 2 Corinthians 2 17, where the word sincerity occurs, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. When those, when those two passages 
use the word sincerity. The word that is there is a, is a compound word in the Greek that if you break it down, it literally means sun tested. Tested by the sun. There was a practice in the first century that probably still goes on today in certain cultures of the world where pottery was made and bought and sold. That the finer pieces of pottery, which tended to have the, the thinner wall structure, went for a lot of money. And the the person wanting to buy an expensive piece of pottery would take it and hold it up to the light of the sun where you could see the inner workings of the pottery to see if there were any cracks in it. Because you see, the artisans knew how to cover those up. They would take wax. Once they had worked this piece and had it drying, if it cracked, they would take wax and work the wax in very carefully to cover the cracks. Now think about that for a minute. Sincere, sun-tested. He says another verse, Romans 12, 9, The ESV says, let love be genuine. The NIV says, let love be sincere. The translators of the NIV thought that that was a better sound for that. This particular word is actually the word for hypocrite, hypocrates, with the, with the alpha privative in front of it. In other words, that's unhypocritical. It negates it. Let love be unhypocritical. So these artisans... who were committed to not being hypocritical, not being dishonest, would put signs that would say, sun-tested. Some of the signs in this, in this Greco-Roman culture, I told you the Greek for this is sun-tested primarily, but there was a Latin, a Roman expression for it for the same phenomenon, pottery that was pure. And that word was without wax, sina, sina sera. And you can look at it, and you see sincere jumping out at you without wax. And so in some of the markets, not only would they assert that it's sun-tested, but that it's without wax that it hasn't been taken and, and tried to be passed off as a, as a priceless, beautiful piece of pottery that has its flaws and its cracks in it that have been covered over carefully. Let love be sincere. You know, you go back to the Garden of Eden and there we find our first parents made sun-tested, upright. You could see them in the light of the sun and see two human beings who reflected the image of God perfectly. Because God said, let us make man in our image. And he did. But the serpent came along. And that image was cracked. And these jars of clay, their first instinct was to hide the cracks. Now they did it through 
a fig leaf adornment. But we know what it was. It was attempting to hide from God the flaws that they now had that they did not have when he made them in his own image. And brothers and sisters, I submit to you that for all of humanity, the default position for any son of Adam, any daughter of Eve, is to do something to try to hide the cracks. We, we have been doing self-waxing for centuries. We try to hide our defects. We want to appear as something or someone that we're not. The scripture tells us we are frail jars of clay. Paul on, goes on to talk about that in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. My sin nature means I'm flawed, as does yours. And we will waste energy with our own brand of righteousness, which, which prompted God to speak through the prophet and say, your righteousness, your righteousnesses, your, your different ways of, of trying to act like someone you're not are as filthy rags to me. In other words, they're, you're full of cracks. It's a misplaced use of energy. One writer that I was reading I think it was John Bloom of Desiring God said the serpent gave Eve the wax treatment in the garden and we've been waxing our wares for each other ever since and then here comes Jesus the perfect consummate human made in the image of God fully man fully God without cracks therefore without wax Son tested. And you follow his life and you realize that no matter how, how he is tested by the sun, how you hold him up in the light of the sun, he always comes up without cracks. And when we realize what Jesus came to do to transform those of us who would like to deceive ourselves and others by by filling in our cracks with, with man-made, man-centered wax, we realize that Jesus came to transform us from being this selfish, self-centered person to a sincere lover of others. That's the only way we get there, is when Jesus Christ transforms us. He cleanses us Paul said to Timothy, we who are dishonorable jars, and he transforms us, 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, into honorable jars. We become, by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, we become vessels that can be filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the glory of God, filled with the love of God, to the brim that we, that we slosh over, we spill over. Religion teaches us how to apply wax. Christianity teaches us that we simply need to offer ourselves to the potter. And in the potter's hands, we are made new. All wax removed sin revealed and then sin atoned for in Jesus Christ. You see, when you understand the call that the Scripture gives to us to be sincere, you understand that in Christ Jesus we have nothing to hide and we need not hide anything. When we speak of transparency, what we're saying is I don't pretend to be someone I'm not. And when I do find myself doing that, I repent of that because that is not genuine, that is not sincere. 
In Christ Jesus, who takes us and molds us and reshapes us and transforms us into vessels of honor, we don't have to impress others. Because you see, there's no one more impressive than Jesus. When we, when we come to Christ, we, we stop being people who want others to be impressed with us and see us and we become people who want others to be impressed with Jesus and see him and, and our lives are then pointing to him and when people point out what they see as flaws in us we are able to rejoice and say you know there's a truth in that but I'm in the hands of my Savior and in his hands I'm perfect Because when we try to cover up with, with the wax of life, our good deeds, our reputation, our, our position, our prestige, our power, when we try to do that, we, we cover up the glory of God in us. We don't want the world to think that God takes people who are almost perfect and gives them that little bit of something, that, that extra edge. That is not the message the world needs to hear. And I believe there are enemies of the church today who want to take us down because we have portrayed that to them, that we are better than you. And we are not. We're not. Any goodness in us that is real goodness is a reflection of the goodness of God shown to us in Christ. Paul said to the Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Peter said that we're to love one another with a sincere brotherly love. A son tested. What, what happens, brothers and sisters, when you're son tested? What does it look like? Can we say by God's grace that increasingly as we grow in Him, can we put a stamp on us that says without wax? The challenge, it seems to me, is for us to be determined to be so real that the reality of Jesus can be seen most clearly in us. A remembrance of what we were. A remembrance of what the gospel has done for us and is doing for us. And an excitement and a hope that the most depraved human being you encounter or hear about has the hope of the gospel. You do believe that, I trust. I read this past week that one of the Muslim attackers who has been involved in the beheading of Christians was met in a dream by Isa, Jesus, who told him what he was doing was evil and wicked and he has sought out Christians saying I want to follow Esau we make a mistake when we write anyone off because what we're saying is I'm saved because I was not as bad as that fellow that woman no, you see, gospel sincerity is honest with who we were, thankful for the glorious saving power of the gospel, and hopeful that those we know, those we read about, you see, the 24-7 news cycle has given us a level of awareness of depravity that is unparalleled. 
Depravity has always been around us. But when it can be reported 24-7, over and over, if we're not careful, that will become the lens through which we see the world. And while we shouldn't shirk back from the realities around us, what we ought to be able to do, and I pray God will help me to do this increasingly, and you to do this increasingly, is to see these broken vessels, not for all the atrocities and the sins that they commit, but for the hope that is theirs when the gospel, which is the, is, is the power of God to salvation, invades their lives. And I think as we do those things, and when we're held up to the sun and sun tested, and if there's discovered in us then cracks and flaws, we say, Lord, would you fix those? I'm, I'm not going to. And Lord, if you want, <clears throat> if you want these cracks to be reflected, and you get glory from them, then so be it. That's what Paul prayed. Take this from me, he prayed. But Lord, may, may my life shout to a culture that spends a, an uncanny amount of time covering up, pretending. May my life shout, here is a person saved by grace whose life is without wax. I'm not going to cover up who I am. But I'm going to rejoice in the grace of God and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not who I used to be by God's grace. And I am becoming what I ought to be by God's grace. And if, I believe if we could be trained by the Spirit to live such a life, that we have a very compelling attraction and witness to a world of people trying to cover up. The Caitlyn Jenners of the world, Bruce Jenner, whatever name you want to assign there, don't need our vindictive speech. It is the ultimate attempt to cover up flaws. And they need to be introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ who takes away sin, who helps us to learn to live with cracks and who in his omnipotence is free to remove the cracks. But it delivers us and will deliver any with whom we share the gospel and for whom we pray, deliver them from the life of waxing, hiding, covering up. So that's my challenge to you today. I, let's be sincere with one another. Let's not think that we can fool one another. Because we certainly can't fool God and Jesus is the Lord of this church and we ought to be willing to be transparent with him and transparent with one another. And I think, I think that that climate is a very powerful climate to see the attraction and the power of the gospel in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let love be sincere, without hypocrisy, sun-tested, the declaration, I don't wax. I don't wax. I don't have to. Let's pray together.